welcome to the next class of data communication networks so in our previous class we were talking about multiplexes and the first type of multiplexes protocol called random access a random access is a mechanism in which every station is independent of other and they does not consult anyone before transmitting the data there we have four different types of mechanisms we started discussion with first type called aloha in which we have two types pure aloha and slotted aloha in pure aloha whenever a data has to be sent the station will be sending the frame immediately there the probability of collision is high so to overcome that pure aloha problem we started second type of aloha called slotted aloha in slotted aloha the frames will be sent only at the beginning of the slots so because of this the number of collisions are reduced and throughput is increased in the two mechanisms pure aloha and slotted aloha we will not sense whether the channel is free or not because of that the collision rate is high to overcome that problem we are actually sensing the carrier or the channel before we are transmitting the frames so sensing a channel before transmitting we call it as carrier sense and it is used for transmitting multiple data data from different devices so it is called carrier sense multiple access so csma in the original version we will be just trying to sense the data and once the channel is sensed and found ideal it will be transmitted so there are three mechanisms in which carrier sense multiple access is done first is single persistence method whenever a channel is ideal it transmits its probability one then uh, non persistent it first sends a channel wait for a time if it is busy and again sends it if it is found ideal it transmits and the third one which combines both the features is called p persistent it will be sensing the channel then when it is ideal it will wait for a time it will verify whether the probability of outcome of success if the probability of collision is less than p it sends if it is greater than p it waits for the next slot and then we discussed carrier sense multiple access in which we will be just trying to sense the channel and transmit we will not take care whether the data is transmitted successfully or not to overcome that problem we introduce the next version of csma called carrier sense multiple access with collision detection so in this method after the frame has been sent the station will be monitored till the last bit of the frame has been transmitted if the no bit of it is collided with the others there we will be moving for the next frame in case if we find a collision we will immediately abort the transmission we will wait for a time and will send retransmit the same frame this carrier sense multiple access with collision detection cannot be applicable for wireless networks so for wireless networks we adapt the next mechanism called carrier sense multiple access with collision avoidance and since collisions cannot be detected in wireless in csma ca we adapt three strategies one is interframe space then contention window and a positive acknowledgement and some of the important terminologies which we need to remember is the frame time which is the duration for which a frame exists the propagation time the time it takes for a signal to transmit from one end to the other and vulnerable time which indicates the probability of collision next important term we tried to define in the previous class was throughput which indicates the total number of successful frames transmitted to that of total number of frames transmitted for pure aloha, pure aloha it is 0.18 the throughput uh, for slotted aloha the throughput is 0.36 and for uh, carrier sense multiple access it will be depending on the persistent strategy right so these are the few things that we tried to discuss in our previous class now let us discuss about the second type of multiple access protocol called control access now this is different from random access in random access no station will be consulting with others but if you look at the control access a station consults one other to find which station has right to send a station cannot send unless it has been authorized by the other stations so in control access methods we have three popular techniques what are that reservation polling and token passing so each station need to consult with other before it transmits so three popular mechanisms reservation polling and token pass the first type of control access method is called reservation method so in reservation access method what we try to do is in this method each station will needs to make a 
reservation before sending the data. So a reservation frame precedes the data frame sent in the slot. So what it means actually, so I have some data to be sent. So I need to make a reservation. If I don't have any data to send, I does not need to do any kind of reservation. So which devices have made the reservation and which devices do not make the reservation will be indicated by a frame called reservation frame which precedes the data frames. For instance here, there are totally five devices out of which only the devices 1, 3 and 4 have reservation and 2 and 5 do not have any reservation. So what happens is among all these five only three devices that is data station 1, 3 and 4 will transfer. Coming to the next slot, out of five devices only station 1 had made a reservation. So remaining does not have any data so they did not make any reservation which are indicated with bit 0 in the reservation frame. Since it has a data, it made a reservation which is indicated with a bit 1. So since only 1 has made the reservation in the second slot, only data station 1 will transmit the frame. Coming to the third slot, all the 5 devices does not have any data to send. So they did not make any reservation. So you will find no data has been transmitted. So this reservation access method is the first type of control access method where a station which has data to send need to make a slot reservation before it starts transmitting the frame. The second type of control access method is called polling access method. In polling access method, one station acts as primary station and remaining devices in the act as secondary station. All the data exchange must be done through the primary station. So first thing we are trying to do is here all the stations are not same. One station is considered as primary, the remaining stations are considered as secondary and all the communication has to be done through primary station. If primary wants to send data, it tells secondary to get ready to receive the data. It is called select function. So if primary actually wants to communicate to the one of the secondary device, it is going to send a request called select function. Now if primary wants to receive a data from the secondary device, if it have any data to be sent, it is called poll function. So first case select function, primary wants to send data to secondary. But if primary wants to receive the data from the secondary, it is using a function called poll function. Let us look at the figure. The first case is an example of select function. Here the primary would like to communicate with sec secondary station P. So it starts the communication using a function called select function. Once B receives the select function, it indicates that primary wants to communicate to it and it acknowledges that, okay, I am ready to receive. Once the acknowledgement is received, the primary would try to send the data of which the, the, the secondary station B will acknowledge. This is called select function. Coming to the poll function, the primary would like to receive the data from the secondary station. So to know whether it has any data or not, primary first sends a poll function to secondary station. Here it has first sent the poll function to station A but station A does not have any data to be sent so it sends a negative acknowledgement saying that sorry boss I don't have any data to be sent. So next primary station will send this same poll function to the secondary station B which has some data to be sent so it gives a it transmits the data which has to be sent to the primary. Once the primary receives the data from the secondary station B, it acknowledges the receipt of the data. This is how the primary is trying to control which station has data to be received or which station has data to be sent. This particular process of control access method is called polling access method. The third and last method of control access method is called as token passing access method. In token passing access method, the stations are organized in logical rings. In this method, a special packet called token circulates through the ring. So here all devices are arranged in form of the ring and a special packet called token will be circulating among the devices. The position of token gives the station right to access a channel and sends its data. So it's not that every station will have that token. So token will be rotated among the device in the ring 
in whichever station has data to send and has the access of the token will send that data and remaining stations cannot send the data until this station 1 which possesses the token transmits after the data has been transmitted by the station then token is handed over to the next successor so once one is completed with the data transmission it hands over the token to the next station in its uh, access successor in the ring so here one will transmit the token to two two of doesn't have any data will transfer the token to three so this is how you will find a token being passed or circulated among the devices which are arranged in form of a ring and this process of controlled access method will be referred as token passing method the devices can be arranged in ring format in different ways the first one is physical ring second one you will find a dual ring where in case one path gets broke there will be an alternate path until the first one is recovered or they can be arranged uh, connected using a bus or they can be connected using a star topology okay so this is what a token passing access method and the device which has the token will have the access of the channel and remaining stations have to wait for the turn this token passing access method and these are the three different types of control access method right so far we have discussed the two different types of multiple access protocols called random access and control access the third type of multiple access protocol is referred as channelization in random access you would find that any station whichever has data will not consult with others and try to transmit the data so there are four types of random access protocols pure aloha slotted aloha combined as aloha then uh, carrier sense multiple access carrier sense multiple access with collision detection and carrier sense multiple access with collision avoidance coming to the controlled access each station will be consulting with others before transmitting and there are three types namely reservation select pole function and token passing and the third type of multiple access protocol is called channelization so in channelization is a multiple access method in which the available bandwidth of the link is shared either in time frequency or through code between the different stations so we have three different types of channelization protocols what are that frequency division multiple access time division multiple access and code division multiple access so before we go into these types of discussions so channelization is a process in which that available channel will be shared either in terms of time or frequency or by using different sets of codes that is what we refer to as channelization and we have three methods of implementation of channelization let us look at those three methods the first one is frequency division multiple access so here you could find the available bandwidth of common channel is divided into bands so the total channel which is available will be divided into smaller units called bands so this is a simple example here the total channel bandwidth is divided into four bands so bands are separated by guard bands to avoid the interference so you could find between these four bands there is a small gap prevalent that particular gap which prevails between the bands we are referring it as this gap between band 1 and band 2 here you are referring with guard band this is trying to avoid the interference between the different bands which are formed by dividing the total channel now each station is allocated a band to send the data for instance here we have taken four devices which have data to send so the total frequency available is divided into four bands which are separated by a guard band and for each station we are allotting one band so for instance for station one we are allotting fb1 out of frequency band one station two frequency band two station three frequency band three and station four frequency band four okay so this is how we are trying to send allow uh, trying to send more than one device by dividing the total band channel bandwidth into smaller units called frequency bands and each station is allotted with one frequency band and they can use the frequency band at any instant of time the second type of channelization protocol is referred as time division multiple access in time division multiple access the bandwidth is just one channel so we are not going to divide the channel into bands but that particular channel will be shared between different stations in 
time stops. So here the channel is time shared between the different stations. Each station is allocated a particular time slot during which it can send the data. But in TDMA, because of the propagation delay, synchronization between stations is difficult. When one station is completed and next when station need to begin and when that need to end and next station when it has to begin, we need a synchronization between this different stations which are sharing the channel in time slots. So to achieve the synchronization between stations, we are using additional synchronization bits beginning at each slot. Okay. So let us, let us look at this figure to understand time diffusion multiplex. In FDMA, you could find the total channel divided into smaller units called bands, but here the channel is undivided. But what is divided? So total frequency is available, but here the time division, which is your time axis, is divided into smaller units called slots. Since we have four devices here, we are dividing the total time into four slots. The first slot is allotted to user 1. The second slot is allotted to user 2. The third slot is allotted to user 3 and fourth slot is allotted to user 4. So you could find, so total time will be shared among number of devices based on the time sharing concept. This is time division multiplexes, but the only problem is we have a synchronization problem between the different devices which we are trying to overcome using some additional bits. The third and the last type of channelization protocol is called co-division multiplexes. So in the previous two cases, frequency division multiplexes and time division multiplexes. Frequency division multiplexes, any time you can transmit, but a limited frequency. In time division multiplexes, you can transmit at any frequency, but only in your limited time slot. So there is a restriction either in the terms of frequency or either in terms of time. But in CDMA, one channel carries all transmissions simultaneously. There is no division of time, no division of frequency. So how it is happening? So it is trying to transmit all at a time. But to implement this, the CDMA in communication is using different codes. So each user in the CDMA will be using a different code. For instance, I have four stations which would like to transmit. The data transmitted by those four stations are represented with variables d1, d2, d3, d4. Since I have four different stations, I need to use four different codes. That is C1, C2, C3 and C4. So how I am going to transmit the data in code division multiplexes is the data I need to be transmitted will be multiplied with the respect to code of the device and this product of the data and the code will be transmitted along with the other devices. So here the first station is transmitting a data D1 with a code C1. Station 2 is transmitting data D2 with code C2. Station 3 D3 with C3. And station 4 D4 with C4. So total data which is going to be transmitted commonly during the uh, transmission in the channel is D1 C1 plus D2 C2 plus D3 C3 plus D4 C4. This is a simple idea of communication in your CDMA. Let us take an example to understand the working principle of CDMA. For instance, four devices are given four different codes which we are representing as chip sequences. For first device C1, the code is plus one, plus one, plus one, plus one. For second device, the code used is plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one. For C3, plus one, plus one, minus one, minus one. And C4, plus one, minus one, minus one, plus one. All four quotes are different. And the data which we need to transmit can be three types. If you want to transmit a data bit zero, you are going to represent it in CDMA as minus one. If you want to transmit data bit one, in CDMA it is represented as plus one. And in case you are not interested to transmit any data at that time, so you want to be silent, so you will be transmitting zero. So three bits, three possible values we are transmitting zero, plus one, minus one. 0 indicates silence, plus 1 indicates data bit 1, minus 1 indicates data bit 0. Let us try to understand the example which we have seen here. The four devices, device 1, device 2 want to transmit bit 0. So their data is represented with minus 1. So D1 and D2 are minus 1. 
device 3 would like to try, remain silent so the bit is 0 and the code you have here and d4 that is the device 4 would like to transmit a bit 1 so d4 equal to plus 1 so d1 is minus 1 c1 is 1 so what is the output of first device d1 dot c1 when you multiply this you will get minus 1 minus 1 minus 1 and minus 1 now device 2 is also trying to transmit bit 0 so the bit value represented here is minus 1 so d2 equal to minus 1 and this is c2 so what is the product of this d2 dot c2 which is nothing but minus 1 into plus 1 minus 1 minus 1 into minus 1 plus 1 minus 1 into plus 1 minus 1 minus 1 into minus 1 plus 1 similarly d3 it is transmitting 0 because it is silent so silent means d3 is 0 when you multiply with this it becomes all zeros d4 is transmitting bit 1 represented with plus 1 so plus 1 multiplied with c4 is nothing but the c4 itself plus 1 minus 1 minus 1 and plus 1 but through the channel we are actually trying to do the sum of all the four products so d1 c1 plus so let me put it here d1 c1 plus d2 c2 plus d3 c3 plus d4 c4 now what is the first bits minus 1 minus 1 0 plus 1 so what are the sum of all those four bits minus 1 minus 1 is minus 2 plus 0 is minus 2 minus 2 plus 1 is minus 1 next position minus 1 plus 1 this sum is 0 0 plus 0 is 0 0 plus minus 1 is minus 1 the third bit or third position minus 1 minus 1 minus 2 plus 0 minus 2 minus 1 is minus 3 last one is minus 1 plus 1 0 plus 1 so the sum of four bits is plus 1 so this is the data which is going to be transmitted which is nothing but d1 c1 plus d2 c2 plus d3 c3 plus d4 c4 i hope uh, this slide is clear for us so that we can go for the next slide so we want to represent pictorially this particular example so data device 1 is transmitting bit 0 which is indicated with minus 1 and that is multiplied with the code c1 and the product of it is minus 1 minus 1 minus 1 minus 1 so this particular is indicating the product of d1 and c1 so what is the values minus 1 minus 1 minus 1 minus 1 so it is indicated with all minus 1 values similarly d2 that is device 2 is also transmitting bit 0 so which is represented as minus 1 and when you multiply minus 1 with the code of c device 2 we are going to get this particular value which is indicating the d2 c2 what is the d2 c2 value minus 1 plus 1 this is d2 c2 so this is indicated with minus 1 plus 1 minus 1 plus 1 d3 for silent uh, here it is remaining silent so d3 is 0 so we are representing with all zeros d4 it is uh, transmitting bit 1 so 1 multiplied with the code of the device 4 will give you plus 1 minus 1 minus 1 and plus 1 so that is represented with plus 1 minus 1 minus 1 and plus 1 now we are adding all those four bits this is minus 1 minus 1 plus 0 plus 1 which is totally minus 1 it is indicated as minus 1 here also minus 1 plus 1 it cancels plus 0 so it is 0 plus minus 1 so it will be minus 1 so to understand this okay this is minus 1 minus 1 minus 1 so it becomes minus 3 minus 1 plus 1 plus 1 so the sum of these three values is plus 1 so you can just this is a pictorial representation of the calculation which we have done previously so this is minus 1 and uh, this is minus 3 and this is plus 1 so second bit is also minus 1 so the value that is transmitted is minus 1 minus 1 minus 3 and plus 1 i hope 
this example is clear to explain how exactly CDMA is implemented with the help of representation of data bits in three forms plus one minus one and zero and next each of the device is given a unique code so to determine the codes for different CDMA what we try to do is we are using Walsh codes Walsh codes actually are represented with a variable w1 so general uh, w so the first Walsh code of size 1 is plus 1 if you want to find the next Walsh codes the formula to be used is w to n equal to wn 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 complement suppose n equal to 1 so you want to find out w2 so what it is w1 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 complement so what is w1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 and complement of plus 1 is minus 1 similarly I want w4 means w2 into 2 so which can be written as w2 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 complement so I write this is w2 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 and complement of this is minus 1 minus 1 minus 1 plus 1 so this is how using Walsh codes we can determine the sequences to be used in the CDMA technique so with this actually we try to discuss three different types of channelization protocols called time division multiple axis frequency division multiple axis and code division multiple axis so we'll the next topic which we'll going to discuss is IEEE 802.11 MAC protocol and its frame format well the next topic which we would like to discuss is IEEE 802.11 MAC protocol in our first unit we tried to introduce what do you mean by IEEE 802.11 which is common language referred as Wi-Fi there we try to understand the architecture of IEEE 802.11 in this chapter we'll try to understand the MAC layer and the MAC protocols of IEEE 802.11 so, right IEEE 802.11 defines two MAC, MAC sublayers that is medium access control sublayers what are that distributed coordination function and point coordination function so here in the figure it will show you the relationship between the two MAC sublayers the logic link control sublayer of the MAC data link layer and physical layer we'll talk about the physical layer in the later part but let us try to understand the two MAC sublayers the first of the type of MAC sublayers is referred as distributed coordination function so one of the two protocols defined by IEEE at the MAC sublayer is called distributed coordination function which actually uses the carrier sense multiple axis with collision avoidance which we tried to discuss in our previous session class okay so what we try to do here so before sending a frame the source station senses the medium by checking the energy level at the carrier frequency we have discussed yesterday in the recent class that um, that whenever the energy level is beyond the normal frame transmission it indicates a collision or when there is no energy transmission there is no transmission when the energy level is normal it indicates a frame being transmitted so we can check the energy levels and sense whether any collision are there or not next once we try to measure the energy the next thing we try to do is we will try to use one of the three persistent strategies which we discussed in previous class like single persistent p persistent or non persistent strategy with a back off and this process continued until we find the channel is idle it's nothing but we are trying to sense whether the channel is free or not and to find the idle idleness of the channel we are implementing a persistent strategy once a channel is found idle instead of immediately transmitting we are going to wait a small interval of time called distributed interframe space after waiting for this distributed interframe space then your uh, sender will be trying to transmit a request to send to the device to whom it wants to communicate so here the sender will try to send a request to send command and immediately after sending the request to send command the sender will try to start a timer and before this timer expires it expects a response from the receiver in form of command called clear to send clear to send indicates that receiver is ready to receive the data from the sender if you are not able to receive the clear to send command from the receiver before the timer expires means we have to repeat the continuous process of again making a new attempt 
and implementing persistent strategy to find the channel idle waiting for distributed inter frame space again sending the request to send everything will be repeated in case if we have received a clear to send before the timer expires now it got a clearance from the receiver so now the sender will try to send the frame so before sending the frame after receiving the clear to send it will again wait for a short interval of time called short inter frame space okay then after waiting for that short inter frame space it will send the frame after sending the frame immediately it has to set the timer and before the timer expires it is expecting to receive an acknowledgement if the acknowledgement is received before the timer expires the process is success in case if the acknowledgement is not received before the timer expires what we need to do again we have to go for an increment back off procedure we need to find out if the attempt number is less than the allowed limit if it is greater than that we have to abort the transmission if it is lesser than that we can continue uh, to reattempt the transmission by again doing the entire process so this is how we are trying to implement an IEEE 802.11 MAC protocol namely distributed coordination function let us look at in another way of representation we have just seen the flow uh, chart of the implementation of distributed coordination function let us look at in form of an exchange of information so first the after using a persistent strategy we have discussed that the source will find the channel idle wait for a time called distributed interframe space after that it will send a request to send to the sender the re receiver after receiving the request to send it will wait for a small interval called short interframe space and then sends the clear to send command once a clear to send command is received by the source then the source waits for one more smaller interval called shorter interframe space and then sends the data frame when the receiver receives the data frame it waits for a small interval called shorter interframe space and again sends the acknowledgement this is how the transmission has been completed first rts which we have discussed in the request to send which is sent by the sender to the destination and receiver after receiving the rts waiting for a period called shorter interframe space and then destination sends clear to send this control frame indicates that destination station is ready to receive the data the source station after receiving it waits for a shorter interframe space and then sends the data and finally the receiver after receiving the data waits for a shorter interframe space and send the acknowledgement this is what the functioning of distributed coordination function which is one of the max sub layer is done now when one station is trying to transmit the data to the other uh, station it doesn't want the remaining stations in that to transmit the data so what it do is when a station wants to send a data to the one of the destination along with request to send it includes a duration of time that it needs to occupy the channel so i want to transmit to so a wants to send to b so it will inform the remaining stations like all remaining stations i want to send data to b and i want this data channel available for 15 minutes so that particular 15 minutes all the stations that are affected by this transmission will not uh, sense the channel until that particular time expires so that is called network allocation vector timer once this network allocation vector timer expires then only the remaining stations start sensing the channel the time duration which is specified by the sender it's not uh, sensed by the remaining stations in that particular network so that is what we are calling it as network allocation vector where there will be no carrier sensing this is how we implement the distributed coordination function the next type of max sub layer protocol is called point coordination function so we have discussed initially the distributed coordination function the second max sub layer is called point coordination function point coordination function is an optional access method that can be implemented only in infrastructure networks and cannot be applied in ad hoc networks so it is implemented on the top of distributed coordination function and it is mostly used for time sensitive transmission so let me just try to recollect or uh, ask you what do you mean by infrastructure network and ad hoc networks infrastructure network is the one in which there is a central controlling element called an access point which coordinates the communication between the devices if you don't have a central controlling element we call those kind of networks as ad hoc networks and your point coordination function is only applicable for 
infrastructure based networks so we have we need to have an access point here we are using a central con centralized contention free polling access method remember in previously we were talking about uh, controlled access methods and one of the type is polling access where there is a primary and secondary station and primary will be controlling the communication whenever it wants to transmit the data it sends and select function in case if it wants to receive the data from any of the secondary station it uses the poll function here the role of primary station is performed by access point so the access point performs the polling for the stations that are capable of being polled the stations are polled one after another for instance i have three devices which are connected to me so access point first will try to access station one it receives the data from one next it polls station two receives the data from two then it gets poll from station three and tries to receive the data from station three so to queue priority to point coordination function or distributed coordination function along with short interframe space which we have discussed in distributed coordination function we are also using one more interframe space called pifs which stands for point coordination function interframe space and this is shorter than distributed interframe space this means that if at the same time a station wants to use only dcf and an access point to use point coordination function so we have two stations one is an access point one is a normal station the normal station wants to use dcf and access point want to use pcf then the access point will get more priority the next topic which we would like to discuss is ieee 802.11 mac frame format so this is the last topic of our second unit so let us uh, understand it okay so the ieee 802.11 mac frame format consists of different fields what are that so this is the ieee 802.11 frame format here the first two bits sorry first two bytes indicate the frame control which is again having various sub fields so the frame control of your ieee 802.11 mac frame consists of protocol version type subtype 2 dis 2ds from ds more flag retry power management more data web and reserved so we'll talk about this in our coming slides and now after frame control the next by field is d which stands for duration in remaining frames and destination id in case of control frames then we have four different types of addresses which will depend on the values of 2ds and from ds and next sc which is a sequence control which is actually trying to give us the sequence number the frame body consists of the actual data which we would like to communicate with the devices and frame fcs stands for frame check sequence which is of length 4 bytes and it is used for error correction so remember all the addresses which we are using here are of size 6 bytes so if there is no data the total length will be 34 because 6 2 plus 2 is 4 18 22 24 30 30 and 34 bytes so if frame body is of 0 bytes so total will be 34 bytes if frame body is of size 2312 that is the maximum size of the data can be transmitted so the total uh, length of this frame will be 2346 so let us try to understand each individual field of your ieee 802.11 mac frame so as we discussed the first field of mac frame is frame control the frame control field is 2 bytes long and it defines the type of frame as well as some of the control informations so we'll uh, discuss this in the coming slide so the first one is frame control which indicates what are the type of frame and some of the control information the next field in our mic frame format is t so d actually indicates the duration of transmission except for control frames in control frame d stands for defines the id of the frame the next we had four different types of addresses address 1 2 3 and 4 each of it is of 6 byte longs the meaning of each of the address field depends on the value of 2 ds and from ds sub fields which we will have in sub fields of frame control we'll discuss about it later the next sequence control sc this field defines the sequence number of the frame to be used in the flow control 
Then the frame body as we discussed, it can be of size from 0 bytes to 2312 bytes and it can actually contains the information and the information which it contains depend on the type and subdefined, subtype defined in the frame control field. And the last field in our IEEE 802.11 MAC frame is frame check sequence which is 4 bytes long and it contains cyclic redundancy check which we have discussed in the error control. It's a 32 bit size error detection sequence. So this is one of the very important question. Make sure everyone remember the MAC frame format. So what does it contain? Frame control which in can concludes uh, the type of uh, frame and also some control information. Next we have uh, D which indicates duration of transmission but in case of control frames it is indicating the destination ID. Then four different types of addresses. Uh, this each of six bytes which depends on the value of 2DS and from DS of uh, frame control subfield. Then uh, sequence control which is trying to indicate you the sequence number of the frame to be used. Then frame body which is uh, of size 0 to 2312 bytes and it contains the information. The information it carries depend again on the type and subtype field in the frame control fields. The last one is frame check sequence which is 4 bytes long and it is containing 32 bit error detection sequence. So the frame control field which is the first field of our IEEE 802.11 MAC frame consists of it's of 2 bytes length and contains various subfields. What are the subfields of frame control field version? What is the current version of it? It is 0. The next field is type. So type we have totally three types of frames. What are the types of information or the frames? Management frame. So this is 2 bit size and if the 2 bit values are 0, 0 it indicates management frame. If the bit values 2 bits are 0, 1 it indicates control frame and if the 2 bit values are 1, 0 it indicates it is a data frame. The subtype We'll try to discuss in the next 2ds and uh, subtype we'll be discussing in the next slide so 2ds and from ds we'll have the discussions in the coming topics more flag when it is set to one it means we are going to have more fragments this is not the last fragment and we will have further fragments when retry subfield is set to one it means we have to retransmit the frame when power management it is set to main one it means we have to set the station in power management mode and more data which is the next subfield it is set one each station has more data to send what it means suppose i have 4000 bytes but i can send only 0 to 2312 bytes so what happens so i have to divide into two frames first frame i can send 2312 bytes the remaining i have to send to the next frame so there you will be trying to set this bit as one indicating there are more frames and more data has to be sent and web stands for wide equivalent, equivalent privacy and it's an encryption method implemented and rsvd stands for reserved so this is what the total uh, ieee 802.11 mac frame format first we have frame control field which is of two bytes and here these are the various subfields of frame control field next we have uh, the different types of addresses used by the communication then we have a d field which indicates duration or id then we have a frame check sequence which is used for error correction we have sc which stands for sequence control which can be used for giving the sequence numbers so ieee 802.11 frames are categorized into three different types of frames what are that management frame control frame and data frame how do we identify this which frame is of which type we have a type field in our frame control which will try to indicate the type of frames so in that is a two bit field if this uh, type field bits are 0 0 it means management if it is 0 1 it means control and if it is 1 0 it indicates data frames so management frames are actually used for initial communication between stations and access points the data frames are actually used for carrying the data and the control information and the control frames are used for accessing the channel and acknowledging the frames the figure shows the format of this control frames so we have three types of control frames what are that uh, request to send clear to send and acknowledgement 
how do we identify which type of control frame is we have a subtype in our frame control field which will indicate what type of control frame is it if your uh, subtype 4 bits are 1011 it indicates the control frame used is request to send if the value of this subtype is 1100 it indicates it is clear to send and if the value of subtype is 1101 it indicates it is an acknowledgement this is how you are trying to identify the type of control frame and this is the format of the control frame just try to observe here you don't have any information so in a normal frame format you have after the addresses you will have the information content but here we don't have it so we have frame control field the duration or destination id address one address two then we have the frame check sequence in case of clear to send or acknowledgement we will have frame control destination only one address and frame check sequence so far we try to discuss in this class the what do you mean by control access and the different types of control access like polling and then we talked about uh, reservation method right so next uh, we token passing then we discussed about channelization we talked about uh, tdma fdma and cdma then we started our ieee 802.11 max sublayer which will be implemented in two forms called uh, distributed coordination function and point coordination function so then uh, we try to understand ieee 802.11 mac frame format and last but not the least we try to discuss the different types of frames so this is what all uh, we people have under our second unit called data link layer hope uh, you people have learned a lot and please ensure you refer all these topics because they are very important and by the next class when we try to meet we will try to start our unit number 3 which deals with the third layer of OSM model called network layer. Thank you. Meet you in the next class.